Okay. Well, anyways, I, I'm happy to introduce Dan Pomerlano from UMass Boston, who's going to be telling us about intrinsic mirror symmetry. Okay. Thank you so much um, for have, uh, giving me this chance to speak and uh, also um, for all the... Um, okay, thanks for the um, opportunity to speak here and also for the um, all the work you the organizers have done in, in creating some some activity. I, I know it's a lot of work for for all of you, and um, I know a lot of a couple of the talks have really helped me um, during this uh, pandemic. Um, so thanks so much. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is sort of work in progress, um, but um, it's sort of based on you know some of the a lot of the foundations for what what I'm talking about are are this is sort of more applications of, of earlier work that I did with. With Shil Ganatra a couple a couple of years ago, so that that paper has already um, actually been published. But um, the applications I'm going to talk about are kind of um, still in progress. I hope they'll be uh, on the archive in the next couple of weeks, but it's not yet available. Um, so okay, so I'm just going to since there's some algebraic geometry involved, and I know this is uh, a symplectic seminar, so I'm going to um, try make sure to just introduce some basic algebra geometric terminology. Um, and so a pair for me will consist of a smooth projective variety. And so that'll be usually denoted by M and D a simple normal crossings divisor. So um, being simple normal crossings means that, you know, it's the divisor is the union of Oh God. The union of um, a, uh, a bunch of smooth components and, and each of the smooth components meet, meet transversely. Um, so all of, the, all of the intersections are, are transverse. Um, a positive pair that's going to be uh, you know, a pair so that D, in addition, supports an ample line bundle. So that there'll be some, what I mean by supports is that there's some line bundle L, which, is, um, you know, which has zeros of some order along each component of D. So it'll be isomorphic to a line bundle of this form with all of the kappa I being, being strictly positive. Um, so, if you have a positive pair, um, the I guess, I guess this is probably well known to most people. But um, if you have a positive pair, the complement become you know it's an affine variety because um, you know it, it's the complement of you can you can embed it in in some projective space and it's it's the complement of um, of a of a hyperplane section um, and um, but we're going to think of these affine varieties as exact symplectic manifolds. So um, the way I want to do that is to equip M with a Kähler form um, associated to some positive Hermitian metric on, on L that's, that exists because L is ample, and, um, and restrict this form to X. So when restricted to X, this um, Kähler form is um, is exact and it has actually has a natural primitive which is given by um, so so H is actually minus the log of F, of the norm of S so this is some function um, where S is the the section which which vanishes to order kappa I along along each component of, of D. Um, and so this is some exhaustive function. It's, it's infinite along the divisor, but it makes sense everywhere in, in X. And, and you, know, you take this, this form and, and it's a standard sort of calculation in Kähler geometry that, um, that, that if you take D of this, this, this one form, you get 
omega restricted to x. Um, so, um, so this tuple here, uh, x, um, the symplectic form and this primitive give x the structure of a finite type uh, convex symplectic manifold. So it's convex at infinity. So there's a bunch of sort of uh, wrapped Fleur theoretic invariants that one can um, one can study. So um, the the most sort of um, earliest one I think that was defined was the symplectic cohomology, which in the form um, that that I'm going to study um, was introduced by Viterbo, um, and then a little bit later uh, Abu Zaid and, and, and Zeidel um, introduced a, a categorical version of Viterbo's construction. So um, where you have uh, cylindrical exact Lagrangians. Um, so this is sort of, this is the, the wrapped Fukai category. Wrapped Fleur cohomology. So, um, so I'm gonna put, um, some additional constraints on my uh, on my pair. Um, so a pair will um, will be called um, a Calabi-Yau pair if D is in addition um, anti-canonical. So um, this is sort of a very the, sort of I guess the only reason you'd want to study such pairs is is from mirror symmetry. So, um, but what what it means to be anti-canonical is that um, you have a volume form. So there's some um, meromorphic volume form on M, which is which is non-vanishing on on X, and has simple poles along the uh, Dan. I I have a, a small technical request. Uh, would you be able to uh, maximize a little bit the I can try, but that. Um, ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, I might be able to do something interesting, uh, something useful. Uh, I'll try for one second. I'll try to do something if it doesn't work. Um, no. Uh, let's see this. Or maybe um, that was. I think. Maybe just reorienting landscape. I think maybe. Um, no, that doesn't look better, I guess. Rotating. Oh, maybe that's a good idea. How about that? Is that good? Better? Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Glad that that was an easy fix. Um, so this, this talk is about um, Rapfler invariance on, on affine varieties, uh, on affine log Calabi-Yau varieties. So we're going to assume that M and D is positive, and in addition, um, that D is anti-canonical. So um, I guess this is sort of maybe not so natural from a symplectic point of view. The only reason you really want to study these kind of pairs is um, from mirror symmetry. But let me let me first before I get there, let me just sort of show some basic examples of. Um, affine log calabi variety. So the sort of the most basic example would be um, an algebraic, affine algebraic torus, so C star to the N. Um, and the way that you realize that as a, uh, the complement of a log in a log calabi pair is to take CPN and, and D to be the union of the coordinate hyperplane. So, um, and then the volume form in this case is just sort of um, the naive thing you would, you would write down, um, and so this is this is sort of in some sense a fundamental example because you can. There's a whole subject that I don't really want to get into, but um, of cluster varieties, which which give you like a surprisingly um, rich class of examples. So these are varieties that are given by gluing copies of C star to the n according to specific rules that preserve this this holomorphic volume form. Um, and you know, the, it's, it's kind of quite surprising um, how many varieties, I haven't given the precise definition, but it's sort of surprising how many varieties 
um, you can get like this, like moduli, like a lot of character varieties and um, a lot of a lot of varieties that show up in in representation theory sort of fit into this class. So they're they're quite um, a rich class of of examples of these um, of these varieties. Um, And so, right, so um, I guess the main reason that, well, at least I'm interested in it, in these varieties is um, Kinsevich's uh, homological mirror symmetry conjecture. So um, what that, in this context, what that predicts is that, um, in nice, so nice is in, um, I'll, I'll say more about nice in a second. In nice cases, there's a mirror log Clavier, um, which is, so it's, so it's not necessarily affine, but it, it still has the property that um, it can be compactified by an anti-canonical divisor. Um, and it has the property that this sort of, if one takes the you know, this variety should have the property that, that if one takes the um, derived rap Fukaya category, it should be equivalent to the um, bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on, on this um, other mirror space Y. So um, this, um, this, so what, what, first of all, what one means by nice, well, Physics, so this this conjecture um, sort of originates in phys in physics. So one certainly expects that when the dimension is less than or equal to three, um, you should be able to always find a, a mirror space y. Um, and in many cases of this are are proven um, in dimension two by um, James Paskalev, Elsa Keating, and then and then a very recent paper of of hacking and, and Paul hacking and Elsa Keating um, that prove many cases of, 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 of this in dimension two. In dimension three, it's sort of much more open um, because, uh, it, you know, sort of in dimension, in dimension two, you have very good, you can almost in some sense classify what all the possible X are. They're all like um, rational surfaces minus some kind of elliptic curve. So there's, there's like a, it's a very, it becomes kind of a concrete question. Whereas in dimension three, um, it's sort of the wild, wild west. There's, there's, there's no classification of available of the, of this possible X and, um, and it becomes sort of uh, a much more abstract question. In higher dimensions, actually, um, I think, you know, people are not really even sure what to expect. I think, um, Certainly, why um, why has to you have to sort of allow orbifolds for for possible why? Um, but even that, um, it, it may be the case that there are examples of X's that don't have um, have mirror partners. So um, so I know uh, maybe a lot of people don't um, think too much about about these sort of categories, but um, I just want to mention that this mirror symmetry conjecture um, has a lot of actually more concrete consequences. So, um, you know, for example, what it would one thing that it would imply if you can find a y um, such that such an equivalence holds, you can calculate the symplectic cohomology on on x, um, which is sort of notoriously difficult to, to calculate. And you can calculate that in terms of some sheaf cohomology on, on the space Y, which it, um, at least if you ask the right person is, is usually easier um, than, than calculating symplectic cohomology. Um, so, so one, um, the sort of the main, property or expectation of this um, mirror space that's relevant for my talk is that 
we kind of expect y to be um, not just to be sort of an arbitrary log Calabi-Yau variety, but it should have a certain property that it's sort of um, semi. It's not it's not affine, but it's it's semi affine. And what that means is that so for any algebraic variety, there's a canonical map um, to its spectrum of of global functions. Um, so there's a map from y to a spec of gamma of O of y, and one expects that this map should be a proper map. So that's sort of like one of the desideratum of this variety y. Um, and, and so the semi-affineness property has some interesting consequences. Uh, the, the most important, or really the two most important for for the talk, this talk is that it if, if y is semi-affine, it implies that the variety, that the ring of functions is a finitely generated k algebra where k is the, the ground field for this, this variety um, y. And it also implies that, that if you take um, two objects in this derived category, then um, this arham becomes a finitely generated module over, over this gamma of O of y. Um, so it, this is this is like sort of a, an old this is a an old theorem that goes back to growth and Deke actually so if you have a, ever have a proper map um, like this you should uh, you know the 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 these x groups will always be finally generated modules over over this gamma um, so my main theorem is is sort of a, a mirror statement to the these two properties um, so it's a mirror counterpart. So, um, so this is the, the main theorem. Um, the expectation that, that mirrors to Y are um, semi-affine, you know, if you translate it across sort of the mirror, mirror dictionary, it translates to the, the following two things. So it says that the, the, the degree zero symplectic cohomology of X is, is finally generated um, and in the proof, we'll get a more refined statement that it's a filtered deformation of a certain algebra, um, you know, co actually a combinatorial algebra. Um, but um, you know, this finitely generatedness is is the mirror counterpart to to the thing, the first statement on the previous slide that the ring of global functions on Y is is finitely generated. And then um, for any two Lagrangians, L0 and L1, so cylindrical exact Lagrangians, so these are the objects of this wrapped Fukaya category, the wrapped um, Fleur cohomology groups are, are finitely generated modules over, over this SH0. So that would be the counterpart, um, counterpart to, um, to the first statement, um, to the sorry, to the second statement on the on the previous slide. Um, so, as as we're going to see later, this gives um, one like sort of the main reason that um, I was interested in this is if you combine this with some homological algebra that I hope to be able to talk about, but I'm not sure if I'll get there. Um, this actually leads to a criterion for HMS to hold in a kind of birational sense. That's sort of a, a very checkable criterion. So it, it so while it, while we don't you know prove mirror symmetry, we prove kind of it, it leads to like a sense in which mirror symmetry holds um, birationally. Um, so I'll try to explain that more later, but maybe I won't get there. Um, so I want to explain what this what this combinatorial ring is. Um, so in describing it, I'm going to assume for simplicity that all of the uh, strata of di are are connected. Um, so for a vector, so k, I'm assuming that there are k. K is the number of there are k components to to d. So D is a divisor with, with K components. Um, 
And so for a vector, um, uh, a non of non of, of k non negative integers, um, we define the support of v to be the set of um, you know these i such that v i is not equal to zero, and we let this um, um, space of possible uh, vectors to be the set of vectors such that you know if you take the the vector v the the corresponding divisor stratum is, is non empty. So if you look at, um, if you take a vector V and you look at all of the I's where it's, where the vector V is actually non vanishing, um, we want that corresponding divisor stratum to be not, um, non empty. And then we let A be the vector space of, you know, the, the freely generated by by vectors in this in this uh, BMD, um, and then um, so this this ring it has this 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 vector space has a sort of natural ring structure, which is um, you can if if you have two vectors if you have two vectors v one and v two and the corresponding um, basis elements, it'll be equal to theta v1 plus v2 if, um, if the corresponding, the divisor stratum corresponding to v1 plus v2 is also non-empty and it's equal to zero um, otherwise if it, if it is empty. And so this, I'll denote this, this vector space with this multiplication structure by, um, by SR of um, so it has a slightly, this, no, uh, uh, this notation um, delta V stands for the dual intersection complex, um, if, you, if you're familiar with that. And this is, if you're familiar with what the dual intersection complex is, this is the Stanley Reisner ring on the dual intersection complex, but you don't, you don't really need to know that. Um, so this is my, my notation. Um, so, in a in a recent in a recent paper, um, Gross and Zebert have defined uh, sort of a, a version of quantum cohomology for like a relative version of quantum cohomology. Um, so it's also defined on this vector space A and is also a deformation of this um, this uh, combinatorial ring. Um, so the the deformation, just like in ordinary quantum cohomology, the deformation is given by counting um, genus stable genus zero curves, but um, they come with certain tangency conditions now. Um, that's the sense in which it's relative. And um, it, in general, it's sort of hard to compute, but a lot of, um, in, in sort of these cluster variety cases that I was mentioning, it can be computed using methods of, of tropical geometry. So, um, so it, it, it's very computable in, for, for, for uh, cluster varieties. Um, and so the main theorem um, above, since we have two different deformations of the same ring defined on the same vector space, both sort of defined in terms of enumerative geometry, um, the main theorem gives some evidence that there should be a, um, an isomorphism of, of rings from this Gross-Siebert ring um, to this degree zero symplectic, symplectic homology. Um, and so our, main, our proof of the main theorem, the way which we prove that, um, that um, symplectic cohomology is a deformation of this uh, combinatorial ring, SR. Uh, it's sort of modeled on the usual PSS isomorphism between quantum cohomology and FLIR cohomology. And so it's hopefully um, a good first step to, um, to checking this, this conjecture. Um, so this is it's sort of like the additive part of this conjecture gives sort of a canonical isomorphism between additive isomorphism, then one would have to do um, a lot of technical work to check 
Um, I mean, the, the, the sort of picture proof is sort of clear following PSS, but actually carrying it out um, with virtual fundamental classes and everything kind of goes above my, my technical ability, but um, hopefully what I've done is a, a reasonable first step. Um, Excuse me, can you give illustrating example of, of this isomorphism? And actually of this ring A. Oh. Your, your favorite example. Of, 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 of the first theorem. Yeah, um, so. Okay. Um, I mean of the ring, of the ring. So the theorem is clear, but description of the ring. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that in a second. I'm, I was going to get right there right now, actually. Um, I was going to do an example. Um, the thing is, we for the moment, um, this this isomorphism is is it's not known to preserve ring structures, but but I can give examples. Um, so that's exactly what I was about to do um, using uh, using work of. So, so Elsa Keating and um, James Paskalov that I was mentioning earlier, so they've sort of computed, so sort of the ring structure on symplectic cohomology is still um, hard to, uh, there are very few calculations that are made, that, that's why this conjecture would be interesting, but, um, but we can um, sort of use their work, which is sort of proved differently to, to illustrate the theorem. So, um, so let M bar be um, CP1 times CP1 and D be the union of, of toric divisors. So um, the four kind of coordinate hyperplanes. Um, and then we're gonna take M to be the blow up of M bar at N distinct points along one of the, the divisors. And then um, we're gonna let D be the proper transform of, of these toric divisors. So, so our, our, our variety um, M still has four distinguished. Um, so the divisor has four components. So and th there's there's one which is distinguished, which is the proper transform of um, infinity times CP one. So we have D zero, D one, D two, D three, um, and this is the one that's going to be the the distinguished one where we've we've blown up endpoints. And so um, this Stanley Reisner ring, this combinatorial ring, um, maybe I should I should say this explicitly. It's it has another presentation where you where it's generated by um, just the function or the yeah the, the basis elements corresponding to the um, to the distinguished components. So. So we have theta zero, theta one, theta two, and um, theta three. And so the Stanley Reisner ring in this case is just this modulo. Um, so we have that. Um, Theta one, theta zero times theta two equals to zero, and um, theta one times theta three equals to zero. Oops. And so, um, 
in this in this case, um, like James Paskalev, I think was the first, and then I guess it also follows from this recent work of of hacking and Keating. They've computed the the symplectic homology in this in this example for for all of these examples, and what it works out to be is that so this is the SR ring. And then SH zero ring is the following sort of so you have theta, so it's a deformation where theta zero times theta two is now equal to um, just equal to one, so, and um, and then theta one times theta three becomes equal to um, sorry. One one plus theta naught to the n. So um, so this is sort of. Um, I guess um, an illustration of the of the kind of um, of what the theorem's about. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe you had something more specific. Maybe you had something more specific in mind. Um, What would be a satisfactory answer to the question? Or okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, there's a question, or yeah, I I have a question. Um, hello. Yeah. Uh, this looks like the quantum homology ring of um, of CP one times CP one. No, there's a it's generated by the four divisors and it's mod out by the Stanley Reisner ideal and something else that I forget. Yeah, but yeah, it, you can you can derive. Similar. You can derive um, those presentations from um, from from this one. It, it's a little, it's a little bit complicated to, to oh. that, that, that's sort of maybe a, a subject of a Nick Sheridan gave a yeah, talk. Yeah, so on, that's that's what I was thinking about, right? Symplectic homology should there should be a spectral sequence with uh, yeah, SH yeah. in the second page, and the limit is quantum homology, and or vice versa, something like this. Yeah, yeah. So there, there is a story like that, but it sort of depends on um, the work that Nick Sheridan mm -hmm. presented in his. Uh, um, but can you give just a quick word about how is this not the quantum homology ring? What should is are you not modding out by the same thing, or what, what's the difference? Um, it, 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 it's not. It's not quite. Um, so it's sort of the, these functions here are sort of the so in in the case of where you don't blow up at all that that would be the situation where you're you're talking so in that case it would be sort of um, this n would be zero actually um, these functions are exactly the the generators of Batarev's presentation of the quantum cohomology so so these these are exactly so it'd be like you'd further mod out by, by the um, Jacobian, of of the of the superpotential. But but these uh -huh. are these are exactly the generators that corresponding the monomial divisor map is exactly sort of these generators. Okay, thank you. Um, so, all right. So um, maybe I'll explain a little bit of how. How this is how this is proven. Um, so um, basically, um, 
so the, the first thing that, that we use is sort of a, a nice normal form for the um, neighborhood of a normal crossings divisor, which is due to uh, McLean, Tarani, and Zinger. Um, so, you know, what, what their theorem is about. So if you have a smooth divisor, you have sort of a, a well-known Weinstein tubular neighborhood theorem that says that you can sort of find an embedding of an open subset of the, I don't know why, somehow the, uh, an open embedding of the, a subset of the, of the normal bundle where, where the symplectic form has a, has a standard form. Um, so McLean, um, Tarani and Zinger, what they've, they've introduced a notion of a, of a regularization um, where, um, you know, basically you have a, a compatible system of tubular neighborhoods. So you have uh, a collection of tubular neighborhoods of each, of each DI where, um, where uh, <laughs> all of the um, tubular neighborhoods themselves intersect nicely in, um, and the symplectic form has a, um, has a standard form on the overlaps as well. Um, so on each sort of UI. Um, being the, the intersection of uh, uh, so on each of these overlaps, there's there's some further normal form in, in, in that. Um, region and what McLean, Tarani and Zinger have shown is that you can always deform um, omega in the same cohomology class and keeping all of the DI symplectic so that um, you have this nice normal form. And McLean, um, I guess actually um, in himself has, has demonstrated that you can, you can also deform your primitive theta um, for this, this deform symplectic form so that it, the primitive is also sort of standard um, on each on each uh, tubular neighborhood and also on each on each overlap so we're going to use this this um, normal form and then um, we're going to let x uh, so we're going to remove small tubular neighborhoods from each um, around each divisor, so that creates some manifold with corners, and then we're going to round round off those corners um, to get a, a Liouville domain. And then um, for each, so for lambda, you know, uh, generic, sort of not in the action spectrum of this of this contact manifold, one gets by rounding corners. We're going to consider um, a function, which is some sort of smoothing of this piecewise smooth function. So um, h is zero up to the boundary of the Uval domain, and then becomes lambda times r minus one. So you have sort of all what I what I want is that all of the periodic orbits are are pretty close to the to the boundary of the of the Uval domain, um, and then we. We define the symplectic cohomology to be the limit as lambda goes to infinity of the of the Fleur cohomologies of these um, of these H lambdas. So um, these um, these H lambdas have their their the periodic orbits of these H lambdas is actually pretty easy to calculate um, if you make all these sort of specific choices. Um, so for example, um, in the case of a smooth divisor, what we have is that you have a single component D and then before sort of perturbing um, to make things non-degenerate, what you have is um, the 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 reb flow is is basically like a um, a circle action in the fibers of the of this of a circle bundle over the divisor D. 
So, so um, what you have is sort of constant orbits in the interior of your of your um, Lugo manifold. So um, those like, need to be perturbed, um, but before perturbing, they're they're constant. And then you have um, orbits which wind around the divisor, sort of v times. So um, so circle. So they're winding in the fibers of the of the circle bundle SD. Um, and then in more in more complicated cases, so if um, in general what you have is a, a connected family of orbits which wind around the divisor um, with multiplicity v for every um, v in your for every sort of admissible vector in this BMD um, that I was talking about earlier. So um, the um, so it's sort of a not um, you know if you if you make your orbits very very close to the to the boundary um, of the uh, of the Liouville domain and the Hamiltonian very small um, along the orbit, then um, the action can be sort of made arbitrarily close to this. Um, quantity here, where W of V is the sum of the cap I. So this was the, these were the um, cap I's from earlier from your, from your ample line bundle times, times V I. So, um, so if epsilon is, is small enough, if your tubular neighborhoods are all um, of small size, then the filtration by by W is um, basically the same as the um, as the action filtration um, up to up to this negative sign because we're sort of it, for whatever reason I'm using the convention that the um, flare differential increases the action filtration that's just I guess what I what I was taught so um, I'm sticking with that but up to that. Um, we uh, we're using uh, you know these filtrations basically basically coincide. So um, so here's sort of the main ingredient in the proof. Um, so recall from um, I guess The standard proof of the isomorphism between quantum cohomology and um, flare cohomology that um, a PSS solution asymptotic to an orbit x naught, so it's a map from um, CP one minus zero to M, which which satisfies a variant a certain variant of, of Fleur's equation. Um, so here. Beta is um, a subclose, so it's a one form um, of the form P of S dt, where P is sort of um, zero near infinity. Um, or so, yeah, so I should say that the <clears throat> Well, well, basically, this 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 um, beta will be zero near infinity, and it'll agree with the standard DT form um, near near the puncture at at zero. Um, and then we want to, you know, you have some surface dependent, almost complex structure on <coughs> on your um, on your domain, and we want that as you go to um, Towards zero, you should be asymptotic to uh, to a periodic orbit x naught and and holomorphic. Um, so and and satisfying this equation, so you're holomorphic near <coughs> near um, near infinity, near z equals infinity. Um, so what we want to do is sort of consider a relative variant of this moduli space. Um, So suppose that your orbit um, actually 
lies in um, in X, so it's 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 one of the orbits of, of H lambda in X, then um, a log PSS solution of multiplicity V will be um, a solution so that everywhere, everywhere in your domain, except for this sort of distinguished point, we want that to lie in X in the open part of the manifold. And we want um, the, intersection multiplicity. So it'll, it'll intersect D exactly at Z equals infinity. And we want it to intersect um, each divisor with multiplicity VI. So, um, you know, if in general, it could pass through um, a corner of say, of say the, so if, if, if more than one component of, of, of V is non-zero, that will mean that it's passing through some deeper stratum of the of the divisor. Um, and so in this in this sort of um, Calabiao pair case, the the di expected dimension of this moduli space is just is just the degree, it's pretty easy to check. It's just the degree of the of the periodic orbit. Um, and the energy of the solution is, is given by, um, again, in terms of this winding number and the, and the action of the, of the periodic orbit. Um, oh, I should have said that in order for this to make sense, the second condition to make sense, we wanna assume that, um, that all of your, um, your surface dependent, at every point, your surface dependent almost complex structure preserves each of the divisors. So that's that um, that's needed for this this to make sense. So um, we want to try to the main the main idea of what we want to try to do is we want to try to consider the case where um, so when when the degree of X is, is zero, um, the, the expected dimension at least of this moduli space is, is zero. And we wanna to try to define a map. Um, so this is the, the map that I was saying from A to SH zero. We wanna to try to define that by counting these, um, log PSS solutions. Um, and they're sort of, you know, what you would like to happen is that uh, it sort of has a nice compactification where, um, where the, the, um, the dimension zero moduli spaces are themselves compact and the, um, you know, dimension one moduli spaces sort of break only along um, orbits in X. So, you know, that, that's sort of the standard thing you need to define a, ch a chain map. Um, but um, there's a bunch of other stuff that, that can happen that, that needs to be uh, excluded. So, um, so the first thing that can, happen is that, um, or the first bad thing that could happen is so there's some additional periodic orbits along the divisor. So this is sort of the three different things that one wants to exclude. So um, there's some additional periodic orbits along the, um, the divisor uh, <clears throat> D that, you know, so if we, this Hamiltonians that I'm considering because because of the way that I've um, I've used this regularization, the the Liouville coordinate actually extends to um, all of D, and so these Hamiltonians extend to all of D, and um, there are additional periodic orbits that um, that arise um, along D that that one needs to sort of exclude. Um, breaking along. So that's the first sort of problem. And then the, the second sort of more difficult 
problem is sphere bubbling and um, sort of, you know, that can happen both in principle at, at z equals infinity, so at the distinguished mark point and then at other points in your domain. Um, actually, it turns out that if you sort of deal with this correctly, that will automatically exclude um, bubbling at, at other points in your, in your domain, but, um, but you know, a priori either of these things can happen. Um, so let me sort of say um, what, uh, well, one, one sort of easy way to fix this. Um, so it turns out that there's sort of a lemma that what you can prove that as long as your slope is sufficiently big, so bigger than, um, than, this, than this winding number, you can exclude breaking along the, the divisor D. Um, so, um, and, and this is actually sort of, if you think about it a bit, you sort of need something like this to be true because one wouldn't say expect to be able to define a bunch of canonical classes in, in, in symplectic cohomology of sort of, you know, a Hamiltonian that has a low slope. So if the Hamiltonian had slope, you know, very small, um, you would expect something to go wrong if you're trying to define a bunch of canonical classes. And so what this says is that you need to take the slope to be bigger than um, this, this winding number um, in order to get this breaking. So there's sort of a, um, the, the, the argument is, so, so in this case, so this is, um, so if this is your sort of PSS component and this is your FLIR trajectory, the argument basically, it's sort of an integrated maximum principle argument that says that that, that excludes in this case um, a FLIR trajectory. So, so FLIR trajectories here have to have like, they, they, there are FLIR trajectories like this, but they have um, too big of an energy. So, so. Um, and then, um, so the sort of the, this, these, these, I should say that these sort of moduli spaces already appeared in my, uh, previous paper that I was mentioning with, with Shiel. Um, and what we did there was we sort of cheated and, um, sort of excluded the, these, the sphere bubbling, um, by just only countering the sort of low energy um, trajectory, low energy PSS solution. So if you go back to, if you combine, um, if you combine uh, sort of this statement here and this, this calculation here, this says that um, roughly speaking, the, the energy of a, um, low energy PSS solution is something like, so if, so in this case, it's something like, it, um, will be approximately, so something like a half W of V times epsilon squared. And, you know, if epsilon is sufficiently small, um, you can't really have sphere bubbling. Um, there's just not enough, not enough energy. Um, and and what we what we prove there is that um, so um, there's using this W of V filtration. There's the there's a spectral sequence um, from you know which uh, anytime you have a filtered complex, you get a you get a spectral sequence that computes symplectic cohomology. And what we proved is that by counting the low energy moduli spaces, 
um, you get a, a, a map from this Stanley Reisner ring to the first page of the spectral, the degree zero part of the first page of the spectral sequence, which, um, which we proved to be a, an isomorphism of rings. But um, you know, I don't it, it, here. I don't. I don't necessarily want my target to be the the first page of the spectral sequence. I want it to be actually um, SH zero. So that means that I have to sort of bite the bullet somehow. And um, and count all moduli spaces, not not necessarily just the low energy ones. And if you're sort of thinking um, naively about the Deline Mumford compactification, then it's sort of hard to control um, the sphere bubbling. Um, but but the main idea that that I use is is um, a recent um, ideas and analysis of of Muhammad uh, Tarani. So uh, he has sort of a log. He's developed some log um, gromov witten theory in the in the um, symplectic setting, and sort of using um, you know his compactification very readily uh, can be adapted to this log PSS setting, um, and so we I'm able to, you're able to build a nice um, compactification where where all of the strata with sphere bubbling actually lies in, in virtual co-dimension two, which means that um, in, in this case, it would have negative virtual dimension. Um, and then to sort of regularize the, the boundary strata, uh, we have to adapt um, Chilovac and Monkey's, uh, Mon Monkey's approach to um, using, using uh, stabilizing divisors. So, um, this sort of fits in very naturally when you're doing relative um, gromov witten invariants. So um, I'm able to, to, to adapt their approach and, and actually um, get a chain map that, um, and once, once you have the chain map, then it's actually pretty easy to deduce from, you know, it's, it's filtered version. If you pass the um, associated graded, it will be this, this low energy log PSS map that we've studied earlier. And so once you've defined the chain map in this way, it's, it's sort of automatically um, an isomorphism assuming this, this, um, this previous result. And we get the fact that the symplectic cohomology is a deformation of this, of this Stanley Reisner ring. So, um, I see it's 10, 17. I don't know when you wanted me to end. Uh, well, you started a little late, so um, maybe in the next one or two minutes. OK, sure. Um, so maybe I can just say like one or two words about the second part of the proof um, or the second theorem. Um, so if you have a, a smooth divisor um, and you want to prove this sort of, um, I guess I don't have much time at all, but um, if you have a, let's consider the case where you have a smooth divisor and suppose for simplicity, you have like some cylindrical exact Lagrangians that um, when you project, so if you look at there, this should be the boundaries. Um, so if you, so pi here is the map from the circle bundle down to D um, you, so suppose these are embedded and they, um, they intersect each other transversely, just, just for simplicity. Then for each intersection point of the, of the, um, of the projection, then there's, there's a periodic structure to the chords that live over, over an intersection point in the base D. Um, so you have a short chord, um, and then over that you, you have more chords given by taking your given chord and, and winding it further around the divisor. So um, I guess the main 
idea of the proof is to show that you know the action of symplectic cohomology to to um, highest order takes um, um, or sorry to lowest order rather takes um, x sort of this short chord to the one which winds around the divisor v times and then um, again sort of a filtration argument proves that um, your 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 cohomology is kind of generated by these by these short chords as a module um, over the symplectic cohomology so um, I guess I should I should stop but if there are any any further questions um, yeah thanks for yeah, listening. We, we leave yeah. a lot of time for questions and answers so sure. We, so I, I'm sure people Maybe. can ask follow-up questions. But why, why don't we um, thank Dan and then open the floor for questions. So first let's thank Dan. Thanks a lot, Dan, this was great. Okay, so questions for Dan. Um. Do uh, in in this uh, ring or conjectured ring isomorphism? Do you have a general prediction for what the change of coordinates should look like? Well, I, I, no, I don't think it's a change of coordinates. It's just oh, what the oh, um, I mean, the map should just be this sort of so the additive map should just be like this count of PSS solutions, and then you want to sort of um, consider in, 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 in sort of vague terms, let me sort of go to another page, in sort of vague, um, you know, cartoon terms, you want to sort of consider now like the case where you have two marked points on your, on your, um, oh, let me just make sure I plug in my computer. Um, two mark points on your on your domain, and sort of let them see what happens when they come together. So this is sort of like how PSS proved that their map intertwines the Fleur product and the and the quantum product. So you you'd like let these mark points sort of collide, and you know hopefully what sort of bubbles off is like some three pointed. <coughs> Chroma Witten invariant, but you have to sort of define this. This it's sort of a tricky thing to to define this Chroma Witten invariant um, because there, there, I mean, there's I guess maybe maybe Mohammed Tarani knows how to or will know how to do it at some point. Um, but but it's sort of um, there's a lot of it, it's mostly a technical problem. I, I would say like. The, the idea of how you would do it is sort of in principle clear, but. Um, I mean, in this example that you gave of CP1 times itself. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. I can go back to that. So one. you have very explicit, two very explicit rings. Yeah, I can, I can show you the in principle, like what it's, what curves should contribute to that thing, but I, I can't, you know, prove it. Um, but just algebraically, what does it come? Oh, it, can, can you just write down what the. The moduli space and algebraic geometry is it's <laughs> no, yes. no no just the, the two rings like oh, what's yeah. the isomorphism of rings that well yeah. i'm saying this is this is the the isomorphism ring is just um so these are all pss you know this should be like the pss of theta not pss of theta one ps and um the curves which should give you this deformation so um this this term is actually fairly easy, um, theta naught times theta two equals one. Um, that sort of corresponds to um, just like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll uh, I should re redraw the picture. That should just be like a fiber sphere. So one of them is just like a fiber sphere in the, um, which intersects D naught and uh, I guess what did I do? D two. 
So, so that's just like a sphere that, that intersects none of the, um, it doesn't intersect D2 or D3, but it, it, it intersects D0 and D1 um, exactly once and it, um, it passes <coughs> Um, passes through a generic point in the in the interior, so it's it's just it's just given by like a, a fiber sphere. The the one plus um, this term one plus theta not this product here um, theta two times theta three is is a little bit a little bit trickier. Um, what it corresponds to is something like um, so you have your d naught. So you have sort of this component um, you have this this actual this component itself the the d naught is itself a, a, a genus zero curve and then you have um, curves which intersect so you have e1 through En, these are sort of the exceptional um, spheres of your blow up, which, which intersect the divisor with, with D naught with multiplicity um, minus one. So it, it would be, so a, a curve contributing <coughs> to the product is gonna be some union of D naught and then some union of these um, exceptional spheres. Um, that at least in the pic, in the gross in the gross Siebert picture that that's the way it would it works out that that for if you expand out this product using the binomial formula um, you know basically it comes to the coefficient is some binomial coefficient and that that binomial coefficient comes from choosing k of these exceptional spheres somehow and gluing it onto this this d naught um, so so it's sort of the picture is sort of in this case, is sort of clear, but you know, proving it is um, you have to you know do some analysis that I am not competent. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I, it's it, it goes beyond my competence level, really. Um, but somebody else who's good at analysis probably can do it fairly easily. But on a picture level like that, would you be able, like, given? Uh, I don't know, slightly, or well, given a different space that you haven't yet worked on, but is good enough so that you feel comfortable trying to, uh, would you be able to sort of um, write, say, like an algebraic relation that tells you, oh, here are the, these relations are on this side, those are the relations on the other side, and here's like how I can transform from one to the other? Yeah. Or is it kind of besides the point where, sorry. No? Yeah, no, I, I can I can do that in the sense that um, that uh, like I understand what the moduli spaces are. I just don't know how to mm -hmm. construct a virtual class on them and glue. Right. That's sort of like where we are, um, and that's probably where we will. Well, I will be for the rest of my. <laughs> I, the, the the analysis is 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 sort of you know I don't know. Do not lose hope. People are working on it. You know, a lot of yeah. people are working hard. So. Other people will do it. Um, but that's sort of where I will stay for my my life, probably. Never yeah. say never. <laughs> never say never, right? Um, yeah. Can, can you say a little bit more about, I think early in your talk, you were saying something about you get a bi-rational version of homological mirror symmetry. Oh, yeah. Um, that's, for that's these these log Calabi Yau pairs. It, it, is yeah. that in any that uh, is that in any dimension too? Because you you're saying something like this intrinsic conjecture of yeah. gross in them is only in dimension less than or equal to three. Or yeah. Um, so like, can you just say a little bit about how that all fits together. Yeah, I guess I didn't get to that at all. Um, but that's fine. Um, it's sort of a bit algebraic in any case. So. Um, but basically, the idea is that um, that sort of it's a theorem of let me see where is it on the slide. So, um, so yeah, using this sort of idea, this calculation, um, like the fact that SH naught is a, is a deformation of 
of this sort of Stanley Reisner ring, um, this combinatorial ring, like the common, the good thing about the combinatorial ring is it its properties are, are fairly easy to, um, you know, you can deduce a lot about it uh, because it's combinatorial. So what it's sort of a known result that the combinatorial ring is um, Calabiao in a we in a slightly weaker sense. Um, it it's Gorenstein, meaning it that's sort of like the slightly singular, but it's Calabiao in, in, in that sense. Um, and so using the fact that you have a deformation of that, we you can you can deduce that your your SH naught is is Gorenstein as well and Calabiao. So it's it's a you know in it's a Calabiao variety, but it has some singularities. And basically, um, you know, if you can find an object of your of your category, if you can find an object of the wrap category that um, that sort of behaves like the structure sheet, then away from the singularities, um, the wrap category agrees with the um, with uh, so I don't know if I have a have it as a exact statement here. So the the wrap category agrees with um, this derived category of SH naught. So you can if you remove the singularities, you so by rational meaning um, by rational means that uh, if you take away the singularities of the spectrum, then away from that you get an equivalence under um, assuming you have a, an object that behaves like the structure sheet. So, so, so it means like away from like away from the, the singular locus of this of this variety. So this is a mirror in a birational, this, this spectrum becomes a mirror in like a birational geometry sense, like over the smooth locus it you have an equivalence and then what's going on over the um, singular locus is some sort of resolution. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit hard to explain it in a few minutes, but uh, uh -huh. no, I think I idea had a feel for it at least. Yeah. Cool. Uh, can you explain how your work is related to the work of, of Nick Sheridan? So he talked here about uh, uh, quantum cohomology's deformation of symplectic cohomology and uh, there is certainly some similarity in the setting, but uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. So that was one of the talks that I was mentioning at the beginning that was really interesting for me. So thanks for organizing that. Um, the uh, so Nick Sheridan's so uh, Gunish and and Borman. Um, so um, right, so. Um, what they prove is that the quantum cohomology is, is a deformation. So under, under some conditions, um, BSM, let's call it, B, BSD. Um, Yeah, and so um, the the deformation that um, the deformation that they construct is um, it's it's given by this. Um, so the the these elements are actually describe the deformation. The, so the so the deformation is described completely by. Um, By um, these PSS log of the of theta i, where 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 you have the so the the, the functions corresponding to each 
um, divisor component. So basically, the what their theorem says is that you can at least they, they get a spectral sequence from symplectic cohomology to quantum cohomology. And the first page of the spectral sequence is given by um, so bracket it's a, it's a certain bracket with the with this element that I that I've written here. So or, oh, sorry, it's a sum of these. So it'll be the sum of over all the divisor components of of PSS log of, of theta i. So the 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 these elements, if you if you take them, um, and you there, there's a bra there's a, a Lie bracket on symplectic cohomology, and so the first page of the differential will be Lie bracket with this element. Um, beta, which is the sum of these um, PSS log components. So, um, yeah. So it's unrelated to, to, to your theorem. So I mean, uh, simply. Well, my theorem says that you can that you can hopefully calculate what you know in order to make this into a useful thing. You would want to calculate symplectic cohomology. Um, and so it says that it's a finitely generated ring um, with, a, with, a, with a nice presentation. And their theorem says that to go for, at least on the first page of the spectral sequence, to go from symplectic cohomology to quantum cohomology, you're going to bracket by this specific element that, that we've constructed. So. Um, and so can you, can you relate uh, this, this ring, which you deform to get SH with QH, and then just combine two results so it doesn't lead anywhere? <sighs> You ask tough questions. I, I, yeah. Okay, I mean, sorry. I, yeah, I don't understand anything. So, you, I think you're maybe envisioning further than than I can go. Um, sorry. For the moment. Um, but uh, like, I, I don't know. I I can't really get. Um, I, all I can tell you is that my ring is generated by these these theta i's, and then. Um, um, and I, and and the, but I don't I don't I don't I don't I don't know how to how to turn that into a a useful presentation of quantum cohomology, um, except maybe in like just recovering Batterev's present presentation of quantum. Maybe in that case, uh, things are explicit enough that you could you could take what I what I've done and, and recover Batterev's presentation of quantum cohomology in that way uh, for toric varieties. Um, but that's maybe not so interesting because. It's, it's already known. I don't. I don't know of an interesting case where, where this would actually give you a, a new a new calculation of quantum cohomology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Was there anything more you wanted to say about? I mean, you sort of got um, cut off for time reasons at the uh -huh. end. That's all right. I think. I think I just prepared. To talk about too much, um, I think I, I managed. Well, but if you if you is there anything more we should know as as the audience or no? I think I think we're I think we're good. Uh, well, I mean, as good as let, let, let's say as good as I as I can do. I don't know if I've done. I mean, <laughs> probably I've done very badly, but it's as good as I can do. So um, it was it was it was very good. It was very good. Um, but I think in that case we should. You know, thank Dan again and 